Rejoice, 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 for this is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We want to welcome you today to our worship service on this first Sunday in September, and we bid you God's joy as we come together to worship our Lord. <laughs> testimony that our living will not be in vain. We thank you, God, for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, but our hearts have felt. As we felt, God, the praises go up, knowing that the blessings come down. And we pray now, God, that your will and not our will is done. 
Give us illumination to your word and give us, God, motivation to do your will. Thank you, God, for every man, woman, boy, and girl who hear this message. And thank you, God, for the seed that is planted, that it will bear much fruit. God, now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our most blessed Redeemer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, let the church say, Amen. Amen, amen. To God be the glory. Great things God has done, is doing, and promised to do along the way. We thank God again for that testimony and song. Uh, Sister Elise and Brother Tyler, Dr. Monroe, thank you, musicians in the house. We are grateful for all of our technicians that make this a wonderful day of worship and praise. Appreciation is extended to our COVID-19 uh, health committee and to our centurions, in particular, again, to all the moving parts that bring this service to you live. Uh, Minister Donna, thank you for being not only the prayer warrior today, but also still the floor manager. So we are grateful for your presence. If you have your word, I invite you to turn to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 8. We'll read verses 31 through 38 from a new international version of the Bible. For the word of God to the people of God, we lift up, starting at verse 31. Let us read together. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to serve, to, to wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet profit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Friends, this is the word of the Lord Thanks be to God. If you could, I ask you to focus with me on verse 36 and 37 of this text. For the Bible says, what good is it for a person to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can a person give in exchange for their soul? And with your encouragement and aid of the Holy Spirit this Sunday morning, I invite you to join with me as we uh, go and open up this text. And if we could put a tag on this sermon and preach on this Labor Day Sunday on a title, A Beneficial Exchange. A Beneficial Exchange. Uh, my friends, this may come as a surprise to some, and it may come as insight to others. But I have discovered, y'all, that the older I get and prayerfully the wiser I become, I have noticed, y'all, that sometimes the actions that people take and the moves that people make are sadly done for the wrong reason. If you're not afraid to say amen, go ahead and say amen right there. And if you know what I'm talking about, type amen in the chat box. For I have discovered, y'all, that just by simple observation, that the words that some people say and subsequently the activities that follows their conversations are sometimes done for the wrong reason. For my friends, I have heard folk talk a big game but have little substance to back up their words. 
I have seen folks show off only to show out. I have listened to debates that had never made a point. I have attended movements that failed to gain momentum. And I'm speaking, y'all, of folk who sometimes say things that, that will incite a response, and sometimes folk who want to get a response and will keep on talking until something develops. You know what I'm talking about, and this goes, y'all, from the White House to the State House, from the Church House to the street. I, I have been around folk, and maybe you have too, my friends, who, whose thoughts and whose words and whose actions and even their movements, y'all, are sometimes offered with, enth with enthusiasm, but, but they are done for the wrong reasons. And what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying, y'all, that when decisions are made that should be about bringing folk together, turn up, pulling people apart, those decisions were made for the wrong reasons. When discussions are lifted that should be about promoting health, but, but discussions really promote wealth. Those conversations, y'all, were made for the wrong reasons. When Zoom meetings that should be about unity result into actions of divisions and decisions that should be about education flip to separation and, and budget discussions that should build community turn to boosting their base and, and a speech on peace is full of lies and propaganda. Y'all, those decisions, those actions, those conversations were made for the wrong reasons. And I want you to know that there is a danger in embracing this kind of conversation, my friends. And there is a danger in affirming this kind of selfish, self-centered behavior. Because when we let things of uh, uh, minor issue become major issues, then things of major concern get little attention. And when big things get little attention, then things that really matter get overlooked. Let me break it down like this and give it to you again. When, when, when I say important things get overlooked, I'm talking about health care for the hurting and housing for the homeless and jobs for the unemployed and insurance for those with pre-existing conditions. When I say we're talking about little things and the big things get overlooked, I'm talking about important things that get dismissed. I'm talking about combat pay for frontline health care workers protecting us during this virus. I'm talking about pay raises for essential workers that give us the creature comforts that we are joined then during this pandemic. I'm talking about extra compensation for educators who are teaching online. I'm talking about infrastructure improvements for communities where children cannot even get online. When I say things of importance get overlooked, y'all, I'm talking about people of faith not looking to be served but now going out to serve. I'm talking about churches not waiting for folk to come back to the church but having a passion to send folk into the community. I'm talking about believers being baptized in the word and not saturated with C in N. I'm talking about those who know Christ for the pardoning of your sins to live as forgiven folk not controlled by a sin and, and more importantly y'all to do something that that is that it builds up the body of Christ instead of committing actions and conversations that are said for the wrong reason somebody ought to help me preach right there because I'm doing the best I can because I want you to recognize that oftentimes y'all there are people who got a whole lot to say but they say it for the wrong reason Oftentimes, there are people who get involved in a whole lot of actions, but their actions are all about me, myself, and I. And I found out, y'all, that in this pandemic, we're going to have to rely more on the Holy Spirit. Come on, say Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit than our own intuition. I like what the proverb writer said years ago. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thy own understanding. 
acknowledge God in all thy ways and God will direct your path. What does Paul say in Romans 12? Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. I like that word, transform. I, I like it because what it means, you've got to change from what you were to what God would have you to be. You've got to take a deeper dive into the word of God, in particular in a time like this. Come on to the text. I want you to understand what Jesus had to deal with with his disciples as he had this question about eternal life. Despite what Jesus said, the Bible gives us a conversation between Jesus and Peter, and Peter, of all things, tries to rebuke the Lord. Okay, you didn't get it, so let me give it to you again. Peter, according to the text, rebukes the Lord. He rebukes God in his conversation. Again, y'all, some people can say the wrong thing at the wrong time for the wrong reason. The word rebuke is given by Peter, and it pitches him speaking harshly to the Lord. I don't know if there's a Peter watching me right now, but you better check yourself before you wreck yourself talking back to God because you don't make you don't make yourself and you can't control yourself. It's all in the power of Almighty God. Peter, y'all, was speaking of his disapproval of what Jesus said. This is a picture, y'all, of how wrong people can be while thinking they are doing what is right. This is a picture, y'all, of uh, uh, Peter rebuking Jesus for something that was his mission. It was a picture of Jesus trying to talk, uh, Peter trying to talk the Lord out of doing what God sent him to do. Jesus spoke about where he must go and what must happen. He was not speaking of options or alternatives. He was saying it's in my will and it's in my, in my position. It's in my constitution. It's my soul and my purpose. I've got to do this. And I want to warn somebody this Sabbath day, and I want to encourage another somebody on this Sabbath day to be careful how you speak into other folks' lives. Be careful how you focus on other folks' lives, because ultimately it's not up to you, it's up to Almighty God. Come here, let me see if I can quote Francis Chan. Francis Chan, that preacher from California, California says our greatest fear should not be of failure but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Is there anybody here who can type amen right there because if you don't confess it, I'm going to confess it for you. There have been too many folk who've done things and said things that don't really matter. There have been too many people who focus on doing things that don't really matter. There have been too many folk who get busy being busy but it does not really matter. Peter, y'all, was determined that Jesus would never suffer, he would never die, and he never raised on the third day. Do you know what would have happened if Jesus didn't die, if he didn't suffer, and if he didn't get up on the third day? Do you realize that we wouldn't have what we know now call Resurrection Sunday? Do you realize we would not have what we now call the power of Almighty God if Jesus did not die for the sins of you and for me, then we wouldn't have the right to eternal life. But aren't you glad this Sabbath day? Aren't you happy this holy day? Aren't you excited this Lord's day that Jesus looked beyond our faults, died for our sins so that we can have a connection to all? Somebody ought to be shouting right there that Peter's big mouth didn't mess up God's plan. And somebody ought to shout right there that you had a big mouth spoken over your life by God's grace and God's understanding and God's mercy. Look at you right now. Somebody said you wouldn't make it, but you're high right now in the Lord. Somebody said you wouldn't overcome, but you're healthy right now. Somebody said you wouldn't get out of debt, but you're footloose and fancy free right now. Somebody said you'll never make it because of where you started, but friends, as I've said before, it's not where you start, it's how 
how you end up. It's not what they call you, it's what you answer to. It's not what you begin with, it's what God gives you to go on. The good news of the text, my friends, in the words again of Francis Chan, is that we can't get focused on doing things that really don't matter. We got to focus on things that really matter. Jesus, my friends, he commanded Peter to get behind me. That word get is a, is a, is a Greek word, uh, Pastor Donna, that means depart from the presence of someone. The word behind, oposia, is a position to speak toward to get behind. So Jesus is saying, I need you not only to depart from my presence, but I don't want to see you as I go forward. Can I talk to you this Sabbath day? Because somebody needs to put these Greek words into your lexicon. Who, and it's simply hupego. Hupego means to get. You need to tell people and circumstances that are trying to stop your movement of going forward in the Lord to get on out of here. You need to speak to those spirits that are trying to pull you down. Tell them to get on out of here. You need to speak to those circumstances that oftentimes try to pull you back to get, oh, okay, let me see if I can illustrate this to you. Having a conversation last week with Pastor Lanson about how important it is for us to let things of the past be of the past, this is a conversation that may help you on this Sabbath day. For we were just having preacher conversation, y'all. And in having preacher conversation, it was a brother talking to a sister. And I said to pastor, I said, sometimes you have to put stuff into the trash can. And I could not help but to remember I was at the airport some years ago, Dr. Monroe, and they had these electronic trash cans. And the electronic trash can, not only did it take your trash, but it talked back to you. And as it talked back to me, I remembered that I had some trash, and I put it in the trash can. And when I put it in the trash can, Brother Tyler, it talked back to me. It said it's gone. Okay, you're missing it. When I put it in the trash can, the trash can said it's gone. And I said, what you say? And you know what, y'all? I'm talking to a trash can. And the trash can said you can't get it no more. Okay, the trash can said it's gone. It told me I can't get it no more. And I said, what trash can? What else are you going to tell me? He said, it's in me because you really didn't need it. Can I help somebody this Sunday morning? Because God is dropping a word in your spirit right now. And God is saying there's some trash and there's some trashy people and some trashy thoughts and some trashy ideas and some no count, no good, low down, trifling situations that need to be put in the trash and not come back anymore. Will you help me praise God right there that by the grace of God and the power of God and the strength of all my God, it is get ye behind me, Satan. The Bible, the Bible, the Bible tells us, y'all, that we are absolutely invited in what I call a beneficial exchange. A beneficial exchange. And that's important for us to recognize because there really does two things that pop out in this text, Miss Elise, that really helps us take a deeper dive to what Mark's gospel is all about. You see, Mark's gospel is really helping us set our minds on the things of God. It's helping us realize that God really wants us to seek wisdom and that wisdom should direct our actions. Again, if we have wisdom, it will direct our actions. Come here, Bob Marley, because you see, I can quote a whole lot of folk. Bob Marley says, don't gain the world and lose your soul. Wisdom is better than silver and gold. Check this out. Understand is that the wisdom of Almighty God comes because our connection to Almighty Mighty God. Peter, y'all, was a hindrance because Peter was more concerned for the things of men than he was for the things of God. What will it profit a man or a woman to gain the whole world and lose their soul? Let me just go quickly to the text because understand that soul, y'all, is sometimes translated as life. 
It is setting Jesus, uh, uh, setting that Jesus was definitely talking about losing spiritual life, which we mean lose one's soul. A soul, y'all, is not lost in the sense that it can be misplaced, nor does a soul being lost mean it goes without existence. But check this out. To lose one's soul means the loss of spiritual well-being separated from God by sin. To lose one's soul means to be separated by God by sin and ultimately separated by God for eternity. To lose one's soul, again, this is what Jesus is saying, I don't want you to be separated from me, but I want you to be connected eternally with me by making a decision, a decision, a decision. And Mark chapter 8, my friends, is really about making a decision. It shows us that we must make decisions, important decisions, tough decisions, and decisions that will determine our eternity. Making decisions, making decisions. I got to take a pause and a break right here and give a shout out to all the men watching me, but also an invitation to those, if you know a man who is over 40, Amen, type, I'm over 40, if you're in the prayer box, if you're in the chat room, amen. If you're not over 40, say, I'm on my way to 40, but here it is, it's Prostate Cancer Awareness Month, and I need you men who are over 40 to get checked out. There are so many people who have made it, who have overcome, but there are also so many people who have lost their life to prostate cancer, and I need you to be like Colin Powell, I need you to be like Harry Belafonte. I need you to be like Robert De Niro. I need you to get checked out. And once you get checked out, do what the doctor says. But also you need to be like Charlie Wilson, Uncle Charlie Wilson, a prostate cancer survivor who helped me understand the importance. He says, I remember hearing I had prostate cancer and decided to work hard at overcoming this life challenge and to return to the top of my game to the music business. Come on, Uncle Charlie, who can deal with prostate cancer. Come on, okay, gap band, gap, gap band early in the morning. You know what I'm saying. It's that same Uncle Charlie who you may have in your life who got checked up so before he got checked out. And you see, when you make those decisions for your health, like Jesus is saying in the text, it makes a difference in your eternity. Jesus calls each person to deny themselves, to take up their cross and follow him. Will we? He appeals to us to lose our life for his sake and for the gospel's sake. Will we? The simply, this simply means, y'all, that he wants us to give up our devotion to ourselves and our desires and count on him. Jesus has given an invitation, my friends, to let your life be more complete and whole if you would decide to follow him. So again, a quick look at the context in which Jesus is teaching and gaining the talking about gaining the world he's talking about making decisions making decisions and I done some research my friends from Randy Connolly Randy Connolly gives us five tips what I call a making good decisions I'm gonna give them to you briefly number one he says don't overestimate don't overestimate uh, your decision-making ability. He says, be clear on the decisions that you need to make. He says, gather all the facts, understand the impact of the stakeholders, and make decisions <clears throat> and follow through. Number one, the best tip on making a decision, don't overestimate your abilities. The fact is, y'all, that most of us receive very little formal training on making decisions. It's by hearing or miss. No, that ain't the way you go through life. You need to get some training on making decisions. You see, there is a difference between problem solving and decision making. Problem solving 
usually deals with a more complex set of variables, whereas decision is a subject of solving a particular problem. You are going to have to make decisions in your life to get up or to stay where you are, to go up or to go back, to lift up or to put down, to give or to receive. All of us need to make decisions, but number two, you got to be clear on the decisions that you make. You see, there is a difference between problem solving and decision making, but be clear on the decisions that you may dig to the root issues, my friends, of the situation you are involved with and determine exactly if you're trying what you're trying to decide. You've got to understand, y'all, is that not only do you solve a problem, but you make a decision by the power of Almighty God. Let me see if I can tell the illustration without messing it up they say once upon a time there were three birds sitting on the fence one decided to fly away and 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 and, and how many were left so the question obviously is if there are three birds sitting on the fence and one decided to fly away how many are left Two, right? Because only one decided to fly. I messed that story up. Anyway, I'll come back to you again. The point is, is that we've got this. <laughs> the point is, is that you got. <laughs> okay, let me go to the third point. <laughs> Number three, in making decisions, you got to gather the facts. Can you say gather the facts? Type right in there and say gather the facts. Gather the facts. In making decisions, do your research. Do it upon factual information. Recognize that, that it seems to be a no-brainer, but it's amazing how many times we rush to decisions because we assume we know the facts. You know what assume is? A-S-S-U-M-E. You don't say it, but you know what I'm saying, that when you assume, you are not going to the facts. Do your research. Talk to people familiar with your situation. Sugar baby, you ain't the first person person that's come to this crossroad in your life and you won't be the last person that comes to this point of decision making. Jesus is asking his disciples to choose him, to choose eternity, to choose a better way of life. For point number four on making decisions, understand the impact of the stakeholders. Do you know the decisions you make today determines the story that you tell on tomorrow? Understand the impact of your decisions. Understand that people will be impacted by your decisions. Understand that you don't live in this world by yourself, so therefore you have to make decisions with other folk in mind. No, it may not be fair. No, it may not be right right now. No, it may cause you some headache. It may cause you some sacrifice. But understand people will be affected by your decisions. And number five, don't miss this. Make the decisions and follow through. Make the decisions and follow through. Too many of us say, I'm going to do it, but we ain't falling. I'm going to try to lose weight. Say ouch if you can't say amen. I'm going to try to get out of debt. I'm going to try to exercise. I'm going to try to give, give up fried. I'm going to try my best to stay away from Krispy Kreme. Ouch, 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 ouch. When you make a decision, you need to stick behind your decision. When you decide to do the right thing, don't oscillate like a fan going back and forth, should I do the right thing? Or what does it profit a person if they gain the whole world and lose their soul? You see, sometimes, y'all, it's easy to get caught in analysis of the paralysis, always want to discuss things that that's what good Presbyterians do. We'll get a committee to discuss the decisions the committee is about to make and get an evaluation committee of the committee to evaluate the decision that the committee has already made and we get stuck 
in the analysis of the paralysis and things just come on, say amen if you can. If you're Baptist, say that's why I ain't in Presbyterian. But the good news, my friends, is that once you make a decision, you need to put some action behind it. Let me see if I can move quickly. For what does it profit a man and woman if they gain the whole world and lose their souls? You see where the answer, y'all, is right there with Jesus. Jesus is saying that it profits you nothing. For what does it profit a woman if a woman can be the richest female in history but in the process rebels against Jehovah Jireh and loses her soul? What does it profit her to have heaps of gold and no notoriety and being so rich that she cannot possibly count all of her money? What does it profit if a couple can accumulate mountains of money but when it comes to contributing to the Lord's work, they give like beggars. What shall it profit them to have gigantic sums of wealth if they only give God their leftover crumbs and ultimately lose their soul? What does it profit two Christian men who are brothers in the flesh and they run the family business and they get money after money and the financial levels are so high that outrageous sums of profit but they are a bunch of stingy brothers. They are dishonest and they are immoral. Not to mention the fact due to their job commitments, don't come to church, don't read the Bible, don't study the word. What does it profit my friends if a young woman purposely wears skimpy clothes and reveals her cleavage and her thighs for all the boys to stare at, to all the boys to say she's the hottest woman on the campus. What does it profit her if she does all of that and loses her soul? What does it profit a young man who drinks a few shots of tequila, smokes a little weed, cusses to prove that he's a man, mature that is, but if he loses his soul, what does it profit all of us to do these things that God has put in front of us, but we do it for ourselves and we lose our soul? My brothers, my sisters, hear what this word is saying. This word is giving us an invitation, a strong invitation to not put our focus on things, but our focus on almighty God. And I, and I just want to close, my friends, by letting you know that when you are focused on almighty God, a couple of things happen to you. First of all, when you focus on almighty God, you've got to be careful about the words that you listen to. Be careful about the words that you listen to. My friends, we live in a world in which we are constantly bombarded with wildly differing opinions, everything from morality to entertainment, from religion to politics. Not surprisingly, my friends, that there's no shortage of perspective on who Jesus is. Understand what Mark's text opens up. It says, uh, who do you say that I am? And, and they're in a place, my friends at the beginning of the Jordan River where there are images and there are statues and there are models of other God and Jesus says to the disciples who do you say that I am and he's saying based upon not what others say but what's in your heart what's in your soul what's in your spirit you see like Peter we need to have a clear understanding of the one true faith but also like Peter we had avoid the countless counterfeits of control. Let me say it again. Like Peter, we need to say that I know that God is a redeemer of my life. I know that God is the saver of my soul. I know that God is the will in the middle of the will. I know that God is the one that lifts up when I am down. But I also have to say, God, it's not your will, but let thy will be done. The second thing that we have to know about this text of having uh, what I call a beneficial exchange is is that we've got to release the worldly things that we're clinging to, the worldly things. Peter was looking for Jesus, my friends, to be the king sitting on the throne on earth, but Jesus was talking about being a king sitting on a throne in heaven. Peter was looking for Jesus to be some great army general, some great warrior on earth, but Jesus was fighting spiritual battles. Jesus was bringing down strongholds. Jesus was making 
making folk understand that with him all things are possible. Recognize, my friends, Peter had a clear picture of what it was supposed to mean to be the Christ, but God had a greater picture of a suffering Messiah. What you saying, Reverend? I'm saying in essence that we have to recognize that God gives us and God takes us through and God lifts us up and God supports us in a marvelous way that God can take what man meant for evil and make it for good. How are you saying that, Reverend? Well, here it is on this, on this Labor Day weekend. I cannot help but to thank God for the labor of a young woman from five points, Alabama, five points, Alabama, about 1,700 people in the whole town. Five points, Alabama is a place that gave birth, y'all, to none other than Reverend Monica uh, uh, Lawson, Reverend, Reverend Monica uh, Lawson, y'all. She comes to us today as, a, as the first uh, uh, African-American colonel in the U.S. Army as a chaplain. You're not getting that. From Five Points, Alabama. Don't know where it is on the map, but she is now the first African-American woman who is a chaplain in the United States Army. It took 245 years for this to happen, but she now stands as a woman, female AME chaplain, a graduate of Spelman College, a graduate of the ITC, a graduate who has gone from five points. You're not getting this thing, y'all. You got to realize is that if you're faithful over the few things, the word says you be Lord and Master over many things. What you're saying, Reverend, I'm saying that we celebrate this Labor Day weekend for one who has labored. But here's what Monica's story is, y'all. She says that she is comfortable in the skin that she is in. She says she's appreciative of what those have gone on before her have done before her. Monica, y'all, a preacher, Reverend Monica, excuse me, Colonel Monica is lifted up today as one who represents if what does it profit if you gain the whole world and loses your soul. Here's what my shout was right there, Dr. Monroe. When she was being sworn in, they played a recording, a recording of the Star Spangled Banner. But when she took her oath of often, everybody present sung a cappella, lift every voice and sing. You missed it right there. They played a recording of the Star Spangled Banner, but they sung with praise, God of our will years, God of our silent tears, God who has brought us thus far along the way. What does it profit a person if they gain the whole world but lose their soul? Here's how we close. I want you to recognize on this communion Sunday, on this Labor Day weekend, that the work we do should speak for us. The work we do should be a testimony for us. The work we do should to just go on after us. The good news, friends, of the gospel, when you, when you serve the Lord and you follow God, you leave a legacy behind. You, you leave something that people will hold on to. And I pray to you this Sabbath day that the work you do, when you're in your grave, as the song says, that, that, that it will speak for you May the life you live speak for you. May the, may, 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 the, may the works you do, those small, be lifted up on your behalf. I invite you this Sunday morning, my brother, my sister, who, who may be distant from the Lord, who may be estranged from the word, I invite you this Sabbath day to let your work now be a different work, a work that's even more committed to saving others and to be an example of God's love. Oh, oftentimes we start out with good intentions, but those intentions are turned and flipped, and now we're doing them for the wrong reason. So I want to call somebody back to, to the church, somebody back to the faith, somebody who may have gone away because of your own agenda. I want to bring you back. I want to invite somebody new who's never followed the Lord to find yourself being a part of this faith. Please join us. Don't forget for prayer every morning, Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. Our youth are online following this service. 
Don't forget next Sunday, congregation meeting, all members join in the Zoom call. Thank you so much for being a part of a loving and a friendly congregation and a wonderful worship service. To know I love you, we care about you, we're praying for you. May God's grace and God's love be with you this day. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, have a wonderful Sabbath day and a glorious week.